Alright, people wanted it, so uh, here it is, I guess. The video explaining how this whole thing works. If you somehow got here without watching the video this is based on first, uh, I recommend watching that instead. Also, this is totally unscripted because, I don't know, I can't be bothered to put in the effort, so, hey. Also, this is the uh, second attempt because the first attempt sucked, so hopefully this one will be a little bit better. So, uh, I'm gonna enter editor mode so I can fly around and hopefully explain how this thing works. I'd say the center of it is mostly this thing, which is a clock. If you don't know what a clock is, it's just something that counts up. And right here, I have it counting up to an upper bound. A clock, in fact, Horio works by wiring the output into the input and outputting the input count, and as long as the input count is 1, a constant signal of 1, it will continue to count up by 1 until this condition is no longer fulfilled, which it will reset because it's not outputting its input anymore. Uh, this video, I guess, assumes you have a working knowledge of Factorio circuits, because I don't have time to explain how this thing works and explain how circuits work, but that's all you really need to know. This thing counts the clock, and this whole thing is complicated and stupid. But all you need to know is that this really just pauses the clock and rolls it back whenever data comes in here to be handled. This just takes data, if it detects anything, it throws in a red signal here, and this red signal just gets delayed by these things. Uh, because it takes one tick for any information to come across. A tick is, you know, a frame of the game. So it takes one sixtieth of a second for anything to come across through here. And because there are delays, I want to delay this three times, but also have the signal active the whole time. So what this does is that even though one pulse of data is coming through here, which continually feeds into these, they're also outputting on the same red line. So what that amounts to is that this whole thing will output three frames of that data, which basically means that it will pause this for three frames until I can load in some other things that pause it, and it also rolls it back. And this stops the clock from being outputted, or output, outputted, it isn't a word, it stops that from being output onto the red wire, because if it paused on, like, t equals 30, and depot 30 needed its data, it would just continue sending that the whole time, and I don't want it to do that, so... When there's data being handled, it just stops it from being output. It pauses it as well as stops the T from going in here. Anyway, uh, this, I guess, would just be the clock module. I'm going to try and separate this video into modules and give it some modicum of organization, which there is none. But anyway, so that goes on this red wire, and if you watch the original video, you should at least know that this red wire is what connects the entire base. All the data of the entire base is fed in on this red wire, and everything needs to connect to this red wire to work. So, red wire sends out the T signal, and as you can see, tons of data is just flashing along every frame, and that will bring us to the actual depot module. Up here is a depot module, and these carry the red wire, red green wires needed to make this run, but first I will talk about how this depot actually works. A depot holds, you know, stuff. And we need the stuff here to actually make the factory run, so this thing wants to request stuff when it has no stuff. So right now it's at 4.7 thousand coal inside this. This wire here reads the actual cargo contents of the depot, but the depot has another part called the v D Vehicle Depot Exchange Data. And this is what tells the depot to actually hold, and it also contains the depot's information, like its XY coordinates and its ID. So we can see that it has a signal of 10,000 coal, which means that it will try to take 10,000 coal or have 10,000 coal in it. And all of this feeds into here, but first I want to talk about this, and this is our condition for when we want to dispatch a hauler to it. So... When there is less than 4,000 coal, that means we want a hauler to come to this location. And if there is less than 4,000, it will output the red signal, which will also light this up, because it runs on the same red signal. So it outputs a red signal, and that goes on, goes on this green wire, which feeds into this. And if this detects a red signal, it will output everything being fed into it. So all of these wires, it will output this, and what it will be what will be fed into it is the data from this. 
and I have these combinators that this changes the vehicle depot ID into a signal D of the same value, so this ID 52 turns into D 52 if you look at it on the right over there. And this is important for several reasons, hopefully I'll just get back to, but it's just changing it into a different state. This isolates the Y signal, and it also adds 3 to it, and this subtracts 3 to it, because the XY is actually of this right here, this location right there, but I want the cargo wagons, cargo trucks to all go in the center, which is, you know, 3-3 three, three, that way. So that's what these do, and they're all, they also isolate it. So this all reads data from the vehicle exchange depot, and feeds in here, and as you can see, the input signals, all, the only thing that is being input into this is the XY, the vehicle depot ID turned into a D signal, and a single value of the item that this depot handles. And that comes from this constant combinator, and this needs to be manually set, because this is what tells the computer what this depot actually wants. So because it has a value of one coal that will go in here, and when the signal or the coal is below 4,000, it goes in here, outputs one, and then that is that it wants a dispatch, and that means it pushes all of this data into here. And hopefully, uh, if you understood the fact that I'm using this T signal, because again, I explained in the video that I need this red wire. Everything is connected by the same red wire, but if I just output onto this red wire, every one of these depots would be spamming their information. It would all get jumbled together and useless. So what I need to do is that the reason for the clock signal counting up is that each clock signal or each clock value is corresponding to each depot. So this depot will only output when T equals 52. So if this is outputting its data that it wants a dispatch, then it will wait on this for T to equal 52. And if T equals 52, which is the D, so if the D value comes in here and the 52 equals 52 of this D, then it will output for one frame everything in it. And everything in it is, again, these uh, XY coordinates. It, uh, great, it, uh, it turned on right now, so I can show that it's holding on to this, and then it output for one frame, if you could see it. And uh, also over here you can see that the hauler was correctly dispatched, and this means it's dispatched, but we'll get to that. Anyway, when something was outputting, uh, this will continue to be red uh, until something arrives, as it did, and that set, set off. It, it, it's, uh, I don't know, I'll get to that. But it continues to be red, but it's not allowed to send anything for later reasons. But anyway, what that showed is that the XY and stuff data was transmitted successfully on the corresponding value of T. So only that frame it was allowed to be sent. That goes into these, which, uh, the only purpose of these is to remove the T value signal, because this is outputting everything, it's a very, that, that includes the T signal. So what happens is that since I'm going to be output the, putting this back onto the red wire, uh, if I just output everything, the T value would get sent in, so for one frame, T would equal... 52, but then the next frame, 52 would be sent back into the red wire, and it would be like, I don't know, 105 or something. They would be added to the T value, and that would be erroneous, because then, like, depot number 105 would be activated outside of when it should have been, and actually should have been able to, and that would, you know, break it. So, and the red signal, uh, we don't really need to get rid of the red signal, it probably wouldn't actually do anything bad to the system, but... It's important that it's not there just because I don't like it being there. It doesn't need to be there, so just get rid of it. Anyway, so that amounts to that, and this is a little bit complicated with people who are just beginners to factorial combinators, that the only thing this does is outputs everything. It does absolutely nothing. It, it multiplies everything by one and outputs everything, so this does nothing. Everything that comes into this is output just the way it was. But the purpose of that is because this takes a frame to calculate this, and this takes a frame to calculate this, I need to calculate everything I want to keep as well to just delay it by a frame, and then they all get added together, aligning on the same frame properly. If I just output this into the thing, it would not sync up properly, so I would be subtracting these things, or adding their negative value technically, but I would be subtracting these values on the frame after that the data got sent. 
so it wouldn't line up properly. So it would be T105, and then it would be like negative 5T the next cycle after that, then it would go back to the normal value because they didn't line up properly. This thing also uh, is important because it isolates the T uh, from any other information being sent in. This thing just isolates T and keeps it from, I don't know, interfering because otherwise, if, there w if this didn't isolate T, it would allow in other garbage from this. All we care about is the T signal, and so it's good to isolate signals with just these things. Again, this combinator is similar to this one, except it's isolating this signal. I guess a big thing in factorial combinators is knowing to make these things that all they output is the signal you actually want, and you do that by multiplying it by one or adding zero, either works. But that is, I guess, what I would call the dispatch request part of the depot. And that goes on the red wire, and you can see the red wire flashing, and very occasionally you might see a, a green signal flash across as well. All of this stuff is a... Uh, yeah, there, there was a green signal. It's very fast. It's one frame. But the green wire is what communicates back to the depot that it how its request was handled. So this sends out the XY and the depot data and what it wants along the red wire that gets picked up by the main computer, and then, if that is handled properly, it comes back along the green wire. And the green wire feeds into this. This is <clears throat> something, so when the, the signal comes back on the green wire, it will also have the D value back with it, because we did that. And that's why I turn it into a D value instead of just using the vehicle depot ID, because this also isolates the vehicle depot ID. So when D comes back, I want to compare it again with this. And that is just the way I know that the correct depot is communicated to, because it'll send back this first sent D equals 52 down on the red wire, then it comes back on the green wire, and this is how it finds its appropriate depot the, when it's coming back. Then that is set to, when it sees that, it outputs everything. And that would include the success signal, and that really amounts to, it, it contains the uh, hauler ID as well as just the fact that it was successful. That's all I really care about. And that outputs into this, which is a memory cell. A memory cell means its output is plugged into its input and it has some condition that is true always, except for a certain times. So that r equals zero, because r equals one, this will not function as a memory cell. But when r equals 0, this r is our reset signal, so when there isn't a reset signal present, it will output its input. And that means it will just hold everything it has. And since data is coming in in one frame, it will hold that one frame of data indefinitely. But the thing is, is that we, if we want to run a counter off of it, which is what we want to do, we need to put it into something else that just says if anything is 0, so this just holds on to that flash of data indefinitely. This just reads if there's anything in the memory cell, and if there is, it outputs a constant of 1, which, so whenever this has stuff in it, it will output a constant of 1, and that constant of 1 is fed first in here. Uh, I don't know. Actually, never mind, I guess I'll talk about the more important part of what it does. And that constant of 1 is fed into here, which just tells you when something is dispatched. It also goes into the green wire into here, which multiplies that red signal by negative 999. And the importance of that is that it actually feeds back into here. And if you'll remember that this works if a red signal is greater than zero, and 999 is just arbitrary. It could just be negative one. It doesn't really need to be 999, but I just like that because it, it's very definite. It's You know that it's uh, it's not meant to do anything. So that feeds into here, and that stops any data from being, di or I guess, it stops this depot from requesting dispatches when a dispatch is already on its way. That's what this amounts to. And it will continue to do that as long as there is stuff in this memory cell. But this will reset the memory cell, this will output a signal of 1, when red signal equals zero. So, uh, sorry, this is a little complicated. And basically that means that when this is no longer true and the depot has received its shipment, it will put remove the red signal and set the reset signal because the whole thing is always going to be requesting. 
this will always have a value of 1, so in here it will actually be a, a value of negative 998 in here because this will always be outputting a red signal. And that is how we know that it has not been fulfilled yet. That's how we know that stuff hasn't com successfully arrived is because this is still sending out a dispatch request. We blocked it from sending data, but the depot still wants to be filled because it's detecting that it has not enough in it. And that, when that signal goes away, that is how we'll know to reset this memory cell and say that obviously the hauler arrived because this is no longer wanting more material. Material was added, and the only way the material could be added is if a hauler showed up. And this thing... Uh, I, I guess I'll go up to here before I get to that. Th this thing. If you recall, this thing will continuously output one red. That means every frame it is outputting one red signal. As long as this is charged, we know that this will discharge when this depot has been successfully fulfilled. But this also feeds into here, which as long as the reset signal isn't there, it will function as a clock, which means that it will count up by one every cycle. And that this clock will only be active... Uh, or, oh, great. <laughs> great timing. Uh, this will only activate while this has memory cell stuff in it. Right, now I actually have stuff to uh, show you. This is the data that's kept in the thing. I, I, I have the X and Y just because, but anyway. You can see the data. Here comes the thing. It de disengages it. It takes a while for the Nixie tubes to catch up. But, uh, that... Oh, oh, right, the Nixie tubes is fed by the N. That is, the, the N is the signal for the hauler number. Uh, and that, this, the, the only purpose of N is to feed this, just so I know which hauler it was expecting. Uh, but all you need to know is that this counts up every cycle, and if it goes above five minutes, that's five minutes in ticks, so, you know, 60 frames a second, but times, you know, whatever. Uh, this will send out an alarm if it hasn't received its hauler in five minutes, and after five minutes and one sixtieth of a second, uh, it will send the reset signal again to, uh, reset this. So this, again, there is a, uh, bug that is still present, but as long as I detect that it hasn't been successfully fulfilled in five minutes and reset it, uh, with a failsafe, it still functions just fine. So that is the first part of the receiving data, and that is if it receives a successful, but the green wire also contains a red signal value equal to the ID if it fails. And uh, I send out this output of 1W, and it's just like this one, that I need a temporary memory cell to hold the single frame flash of this, and it's just like the other one, uh, that it has another memory cell that actually does the counting, and this one is another uh, timer, but without getting, th this is just a jumble of wires, but all of this thing, it looks complicated, but all it does is be similar to this, except it counts up to uh, 1,000 frames and blocks it from making requests. So it goes back in here, you can see this feeds back into this negative 999 uh, red signal thing, and so this also blocks it from making requests if it failed to find a hauler. What this does is that if it receives the signal that it couldn't find a valid hauler, it blocks it from making any more requests for a thousand frames. And the purpose of this is so uh, it doesn't spam, it doesn't spam the main computer with, because if it didn't find it the first time, it's probably not going to find it again, but we still eventually want it to check again. This just adds a delay for it to ask again. Because the computer handling one of these requests, because it, to find out that there wasn't a valid hauler, it needs to go across all haulers, and that takes time. So it takes one frame to go along every hauler, so that we, I have 68 haulers in the system, so that means it takes one second at least to figure out that it failed. And that means that every time one of these fails, it eats a second of time that could be spent dispatching actual requests. So I don't want it to be constantly requesting if it failed the first time. I want it to wait a bit, chill out, and then try again later. That is all it does. Okay, that is the main depot. That is all there really is to say about that. And already this is extremely long. And the problem is, is that there is actually more to the depot. And that is the mining depot, which is special because it has this extra mode. And that is worth explaining because ordinarily, go back here, this 
has output set to on, and this is what contains all of our signals. This is what tells it what to pick up and where the X, Y values are. But over here, we have it set to off. And this actually isn't part of our thing. We are actually feeding in these signals from elsewhere because it's off. We are feeding these signals in. This travels along. This is what handles the inventory data and the combinator data on these things, which are localized. These, these red and green wires are only connected to the depot. And these instead feed into this combinator and the output of this whole thing. So this combinator is where the value actually comes instead, which means that you need to manually uh, copy this to there, turn this off, and then ensure that it's coming from there and is properly connected. This is what feeds these instead. These are just like in the other thing, the XY, the thing that isolates the depot ID, all that stuff. It's the exact same, except it's coming from a constant combinator instead of the depot itself. It is the exact same. Uh, but the difference is, is that we feed in the uh, data, we feed in the what takes and gives away data from here instead, because ordinarily these depots, if they were constantly outputting that, they would only be able to either take away or give to. They'd only be able to pick up or push their inventories. And because they, these are mining depots, we need them to be able to take from the miner, but give to a hauler. And the only way to accomplish that is that to output this value of, you know, 13,000 copper ore. Uh, hey, it's on. Uh, 13,000 copper or when a hauler isn't dispatched, but send this negative one when there is a hauler dispatched. And this whole thing is a little complicated because that means that if you'll recall, this is the thing that outputs a uh, red signal if there's anything in this memory cell. It's the exact same, except it's just flipped the other way. Uh, that green, that red signal comes in here and that is just isolated from any other signals. We only care about the red signal, there's various reasons for that. But that red signal is sent in here. These combinators are constantly trying to output, but they will only be allowed through if this one is... Red will be zero when there isn't a hauler dispatched. So when there isn't a hauler dispatched, this one is outputting. This means that the depot will try to fill. But when there isn't when there, sorry, when there is a hauler dispatched, this will output negative one, because when red signal is greater than zero, that means a hauler is on the way. That would be great if that was all we could use it for, but unfortunately, when the hauler arrives and the red signal disappears because we know that the level went below what we were expecting, it will reset everything and the red signal will disappear, but the hauler will still be there, because it takes like five seconds for the hauler to uh, leave. So, the moment the hauler arrives, it will flick off, it'll put it into the hauler, it'll flick off, and then it'll take back from the hauler. And we don't want that, which requires this very complicated network of things uh, to <laughs> read that. And so, basically what that amounts to is that after the red signal vanishes, we need it to exist here as a ghost for a while. So, when the original red signal vanishes, we need to mimic a red signal for a set period of time until the hauler can leave. Alright, uh, yeah, now, now we can see that it's outputting this one instead of this one, and that is, again, going along its wire over there. So, this is what happens. This takes the red signal, and it says, if red signal is gone, output this, and if the copper or signal from here is less than zero, which means if it's negative one, I'll also output this. This will only happen for one frame, because this will output, and then the red... This is very precise, I guess, alignment of ticks, because it relies on the red signal equaling zero, which means it vanished right when this is still outputting a value of negative one. So it will, dis it will detect if the frame that we're still outputting negative one, because it hadn't made it to cancel this yet, this will output two checkmark signals, when it detects that the original red signal vanished. So, when the original red signal vanished, it goes in here and outputs a green signal. This basically functions as an AND gate. So, if there's two green signals, do this. Okay, because this mimics a red signal, and I'm using the presence of a red signal as the indicator that this works, uh, when the red signal from the fake red signal from this one goes through here and disappears, this will also activate again and start the cycle, so it becomes a cycle. But instead, I need to add a thing that outputs this 
as a fake to n notify it that we actually want to break it. I really can't think of a way to adequately explain that how it this cyclical thing of mimicking the red signal and feeding it back in here because this thing needs to feed off of the fake red signal to know which of these two things to output but I need to send a plus one copper ore value into this to stop it from sending out a check signal when the red signal disappears. So when the red signal disappears from here, it will go through, but if the red signal disappeared from here, it will also be blocked by this. So it won't be able to send out the signal from that. Okay, so <laughs> that's really confusing, but this is another clock, which as you should know, any Anytime I clock, any time I say it's a clock, it means it's a counter. This will go up as long as the green signal exists, exists and the green signal exists in here. Okay, yes, yeah, so now we can see that this is counting up. The green signal also counts up, but that doesn't matter, we don't care. This thing will work and continue try to give stuff to haulers until T is greater than that. So we can see that the input signal is going up and up and up, and it is still in this mode is indicated by this light and it will keep going up over here until the hauler can get out of there and receive this and now it's back to the normal state because the hauler is left it's waited around long enough and now the mode is on pickup instead of give away so all this really amounts to is that it's a very complicated way to make it wait and pick which signal to give off based on its mode. These things don't do anything except uh, drive the light. So this thing will read if the copper value from here being output is negative one. This thing will read if it's this. So if the thing is coming from here, output yellow. If the thing is coming from here, output blue. That's all that does. And this is just the combinator that drives this clock. I could make this a little bit better, but, but it works. I don't want to. Anyway, that's talking about the depots, except for maybe the one little nugget of information is that if this is a pickup depot, depot instead, it needs these values, and it needs a negative one and a P to be sent in this constant combinator that feeds into this thing instead. It wants to know that. Uh, <sighs> okay, now we travel back along the wires all the way up here and we see where this feeds into the first phase of the data handling. This thing is a, again, a complicated thing that requires timing. Timing is very important when you're doing something this complicated in Factory because again, the frames need to line up. It takes one tick to go through a combinator and get its output. So we do this because we don't actually want the T value to be put inside this here. This is what reads the data and puts it into the system, and it comes off of this line. But if you'll look at it, you'll notice the T value is suspiciously absent from here. And that is because when the T value comes out from here along this and into here, it actually feeds into here and is delayed by one signal. But So it outputs here, but that is also put into here, which multiplies it by negative one and feeds that into this. So the T value is getting nullified inside of this. So it is uh, outputting everything, but is also nullifying the T value because a T value of say 100 is being fed into the lines, but a T value of 100 is also being fed into here. So any time it is being nullified on every frame. So it's not that the T value isn't f present here, it's just that its negative counterpart is always present in every frame yeah, I, let me pause this. Okay, if I can find a... Uh, oh. There should be... There we go, okay. So you'll see that T doesn't exist. This one is output signal negative 23T. This one is output signal 23T. Negative, negative 23, positive 23. These both feed into here because this one is positive 23 on this line. This one is negative 23 coming out of this. They both come off of this red wire into there. And you can see that the negative 23 and the 23 collide in here, as well as with the rest of the data. So only the t, only the t value is nullified, and that's very important because we don't want it in there. It's it's stupid. It's complicated. And we actually use the t value later to do other stuff. This thing is an important thing, and this has the each signal, which means each thing that equals negative one, which would be that uh, iron plate signal right there. Each thing that out 
that is equal to negative 1, it outputs that along this line. So let's, let's go to next frame. All right, input signal, next, fr next frame. You can see that it's inputting this. And this is also being inputted there. It's on the same line, same frame. This next will output this, value of negative 1 iron plate. This output negative of negative one iron plate feeds into here, and this is where I talk about the cargo module. It's a little bit tied up in here, but you know what? Never mind. I'm talking about the uh, scanner module instead. Okay, so the hauler data scanner uh, is a clock that rolls over. Uh, this thing outputs a variety of things. But this quantity of type signal uh, is what this. This is this knows this. This is part of the mod. It just knows everything about haulers. It it scans all the haulers and reads their data. It knows everything about them. So it also knows the quantity of that type. So it knows that there are 68 haulers in the system. And I use that to uh, be the upper bound of my clock. So if AI hauler is less than quantity of type, this means that it will go from one to 68 and then reset. That goes in here, and this feeds into this. When you feed a hauler ID into the input terminal of a scanner, it outputs everything about that hauler. So, uh, hauler 67 is the lucky number right now. I'm sure I could find it somewhere over here. 67, there it is. Let's find the one. Okay, so hauler 67 has uh, 5,700 iron ore in it. And we can see that the output of this signal is uh, 57 iron ore. And it also knows its XY position, where it just is. We don't use that. It also knows that it has four nuclear fuel in it. So that is reading that hauler. This just reads the quantity. This is just a, a readout of using the same signal. Uh, this also isolates that signal. So uh, ordinarily we'd get a ton of garbage feeding in here, but we only care about this signal to run this, and that does that. Anyway, the rest of the stuff goes along this red wire, and that is where all of the hauler data is uh, used. You can see that the hauler data is input into several places in the system, namely here and here in these things. These are the same, but uh, the hauler data is input there for reasons, but one I'm talking about right now is uh, this one, and this will output everything, which is it outputs everything, uh, meaning the hauler data. So everything on this line will output it if it equals C, and each one of these has its own uh, hauler as dictated by this. So this, this lane is for hauler 1, and so this will output everything if the hauler ID from this signal equals C, which is stands for the hauler ID of this. So uh, it gets turned to C here, so, so this is just the hauler ID transformed into a different type of signal. It's the same value, just a different type of signal. And that is how we know to uh, output this. So on this red wire, there will only ever be one frame of data. And we do that by selectively choosing data from this line. This is how the haulers actually output their data into the system. And we do this by, you know, again saying that if it equals this, output everything. So we get the appropriate thing on the appropriate frame, but we it also has a thing of that if the hauler is busy, it does not output its data because we block the C from being outputted. So if the red signal is present, it does not output signal C. So that means that it, even if hauler equals uh, C, which for this one would be three, even if that happens, uh, it would not output its data and it would not be read into the system. This is a big delay thing. I don't know if it actually solved the problem, but I'm not removing it because it still works, and I'd rather just leave it. Anyway, all of that is connected on the same line. You can see it highlighted here. Uh, all of that is connected on the same line. It also goes along these uh, wires to connect here, similarly. Uh, so all of this output is shared on these two lines. All of this output is shared, and this is what actually contains all of the haulers' information as far as the system is concerned. It also goes over here, but this is just a, a quick thing to uh, read the quantity of type signal. That, that That's all it does. The, the only purpose of the data coming down here is to get the quantity of type signal, because the quantity of type signal is generally not really worried about here. Anyway, that feeds into this, 
th this is a thing to try and delay it because it take there's an overhead for activating the lockout signal of this. This is a, an attempt to stop a hauler from being uh, called upon before the lockout has been activated because again everything has a delay. But anyway, this whole thing reads all of the data into this big array and this reads everything and this reads the inventories. So the reason I need all of these combinators set to different things is that if it is detecting all of this nonsense, it only isolates that because there's a bunch of garbage that we don't care about on this data. But we see that there is cargo and we only care about that cargo, so we only want that cargo signal. Yeah, so so right now on the green wire, that means the previous hauler had stone, but uh, on this one, we just care about the cargo signals, and this reads those cargo signals, it isolates it. So the input is all this gobbledygook garbage, but the output signal is a nice, clean, singular value of what was on it. So if it detects any stone, it just outputs a value of one stone. That just means that there was stone on that. And this thing also, uh, this thing also detects the absence of a hauler, because if the hauler was deactivated here, and it's not available, it will input into here, and it will read that there is absolutely nothing. Every, if everything is equal to zero, it outputs a one red signal. That means that the hauler was not valid, because otherwise, uh, this thing is also how I determine if the hauler is empty. So if none of these are present, then the hauler is empty. But if there is no signal just to begin with, then it would find a... It would think that a busy hauler is valid as empty because it's not actually outputting anything. So this just detects if the hauler isn't there, and it will say that it's not empty, it's busy. This is what this does. But that is all sort of off-topic from this, which is a pretty complicated thing that... Uh, is a clock designed to roll over, again similar to the other ones except it's a clock. It rolls over the quantity of type signal, so this means it goes from 1 to 68, and it inputs into here as a thingamahoozy. This sets out a reset signal once on that, this sets out a reset signal. These things just handle reset signals because I need separate reset signals for this. This is a little complicated because it's a sort of two-step uh, process to actually do this, but to give you the idea of this, that this is just a memory cell that contains all of the cargo of everything. And how that works is that I have one half of it reading everything as it is, outputting to a memory cell, then I have the memory cell that holds the previous. So I have something that learn that as it goes from 1 to 68, it continually accrues all of the data. So each time a signal of 1 comes across, it goes in and it keeps counting up. So you'll see that we're at near 68, so this is basically the end of a cycle and it has everything in it. So this one has everything in it. Okay, that is a memory cell that contains everything from that cycle, but we also need another memory cell to contain everything from the previous cycle. And that is what this does. It's dreadfully complicated and I hope you can like try and decipher it from the wires itself. And I don't know, I... I honestly kind of forgot exactly how this thing works myself, I just know what it does, but it is a memory cycle, or a memory cell, that reads everything from the cycle from 1 to 60, and then a nut that outputs into another memory cell that remembers everything from the previous cycle. So the importance is that if I just ran this whole thing off of that, is that it would reset every time, it would start back at zero, I wouldn't have a constant readout, but with this it resets after learning and rolling over every single hauler, it outputs the total of that, and that means that every cycle it gets updated. That's what this lamp does, it just determines if the uh, reset signal happened, and it just says that, ooh, uh, we got an update, and that is what feeds into here. You can see the input signals are all in here, and this is another row of uh, signal isolators to isolate the specific uh, item that I'm interested in, and these each feed into their own lanes, and these lights are handy indicators to tell you if they are over their limit. Uh, this, this green signal is wired on everything to the red wire. This red wire only goes to uh, all the lights. It is isolated. And I can do this. Uh, this is a little bit off topic, but uh, red signal has higher priority than green signal. So even though it's constantly outputting green signal, when I want to output a red signal from here, uh, it overrides it and turns it red. But... 
This is the limit. Each one of these has a limit, and uh, some of them are higher than others because I care more about that item, and I think that it needs more, but th they can be adjusted. But what that amounts to is that if the signal is greater than the limit, then output red, and that is to indicate that it is over limit, and that means I don't want anything else of this type of value or th this type of resource to be allowed to be read into the network, because picking up things is different from, you know, a request. A request will only request when it's out of stuff, so if, if it's filled up, it won't ever request anything new, but a push signal will continually try to get rid of what it has, even if there's like 50 of that resource already in the network. So this is a very important thing that ensures that there is always empty haulers by limiting what resources, or the limit of resources. So you can see that uh, coal here has a value of 4, which is greater than the limit, quite handily. And this thing only goes up to 4, because I just assumed that <laughs> uh, not many things would actually require a 4 haulers holding it, except for the main resources, but anyway... Uh, that means that it will output what it has along this red line, and that feeds, or th this thing, so if the anything is greater than L, so if anything has surpassed the limit, output anything. And for this one, you can see input 4, output 4, and that means that because coal has surpassed the limit, goes in here, and goes along this line and goes into this. And you can see the input signal is just exactly the uh, other stuff, but if you'll look over here, you might see some things missing. So iron is, n is under the limit, and you can see that iron ore is suspiciously missing from this list, because this list only contains the signals of things that are over the limit. And the importance of this is that this then subtracts one from everything in here, so you can see every single thing in here is subtracted by one, and these are fed in on the same frames, and then everything is, uh, everything is multiplied by negative one, and if you can imagine what would happen if you subtracted by one, then added everything multiplied by negative one, you'd get every single thing set to a value of negative one, and you'll see that's precisely what we have here. Everything that is over the limit is negative one held inside of this constantly. You'll see that there's a value uh, suspiciously set to negative two, and that is because the other half of the negative one is coming from this. This is a part of the request. So when a depot is requesting a pickup of iron, that means it's trying to give away iron. The reason I have it s isolate that negative one identifier value of a negative one iron plate, meaning it's trying to give away iron plate, that feeds into here, along with all the other signals, and if it detects anything is, is less than negative one, which means that, you know, this will only ever output negative one, so that means that anything being less than negative one means it's negative two, and it came from the data. And so what that amounts to is that if that happens, it outputs a red signal, and I use this red signal uh, to block this. If a red signal is present, it will not output everything. It will never let this data enter the system because we don't want it. We don't want it to be able to request a hauler because we already have enough of that item. So, that blocks it. And these two things are merely for delays. You can see the output signal is this, the input signal is this, and next frame is a very important frame because this delayed it to give it time to... We need two of these to delay it because we need have two of these that process it. So, next frame, input, output. This is outputting that data, and this is outputting one. And these are colliding in here, and you can see that the input signal is everything, but also the blocker red signal. And that means next frame, nothing will make it through. That is how this part works. And the general overlay of how the... Uh, resource or the cargo reader works. That's all it does. It's fairly simple. Also, there's a value that determines how many empty things are, and I read the empty signal from here. Uh, just quick uh, look ahead. I read the empty signal from there. That feeds into here. This is purely to isolate it, because uh, I had a glitch earlier. And this thing reads, you know, everything and isolates it from the green track into the cargo reader. This, uh, 
uh, honestly, I actually forget what this does, but anyway, uh, <laughs> this all feeds into here. This is, I guess, a very important part of the machine. This is the data handler. This whole part, and I guess, I don't know, I wish I could like do a, a box drag, but this thing that I'm circling here is the data handler. This is actually what handles dispatching to things. This thing, uh, I don't want anything else. So if a value happened right after it, so say depot 27 output and depot 28 both output, they were right after one another. I do not want depot 28 to be able to get in here. So what this does is that it detects if anything came through and then it outputs or it, it detect it allows anything through as long as red doesn't exist but the, the same wire that holds the data feeds into here as well and this detects if anything is greater than zero it outputs one red and that feeds back into here this is a big jumble of wires and I know this part will probably be confusing and no matter what I do people probably won't understand it but that feeds into here and that means that next cycle this will let it through the first cycle or the first tick but then the red signal will be present next tick. And that means this will only allow through one tick of data. And this other thing exists to allow to continue to output the red signal if it detects anything in here. And so this outputting stuff means that there's stuff in here and this will block it for yet another frame. And then it will also feed in from the memory cell which will block it indefinitely as long as there's stuff in here. So I can't just read from the memory cell because that would leave a frame empty for stuff to get in. I need this extra combinator here to cover that missing frame. Because again, this stuff gets very complicated when you're dealing with this uh, level of complexity with the alignments of data and the timings of data. But all that, all you really need to know about this thing is that it only lets through one frame of data, and as long as there's stuff in here, it will not let anything else. So, that's what that does. This continues on into the memory cell that I mentioned later, and it has a million wires coming off of it because it is very complicated. This feeds into here, which I mentioned before, which pauses the clock, and I also don't know if this is necessary, but it feeds into here and sees if anything is equal to 1, and I would hope to find a valid value inside of the memory cell. Okay, so I have managed to capture a value that is valid. As you can see, Depot 51 wants coal. Depot 51 is, I don't know, I'm just gonna guess it's this one. Yeah, cool. Depot 51 has successfully pushed through that it wants coal. And... <clears throat> that means we need to handle it here. This means I need to hold this in a memory cell because what this does is it holds this data and allows it to be compared with everything else. This is a timer. I don't need a memory cell to roll over all of the available haulers because that's what this does. This is where the hauler data actually comes from, the stuff we care about at least. This is what actually iterates through all the haulers. All I need this to be is a memory cell holding the data to compare this against. This exists to compare this and this against. Uh, I should mention now that this it's, it's important that this uh, takes the hauler number, the hauler ID turns into N, and outputs it in here. I'll just cut that part out. Anyway, this whole thing exists to be compared against to this. And this is something that just reads if there's anything in the memory cell, output a constant of t. You might remember this arrangement because it's the same thing I did at all the other depots to just know that if there's something in the memory cell, start a timer. And this is how you would do a timer on the presence of information. You just, you know, do this. And so you start a clock here. This counts up and this goes for however long it took it to do it. I have it a uh, hard coded to 80, which means that it takes 80 seconds or not seconds, 80 ticks to go through a cycle. So all you need to know is that this is a counter and that is how I know if it's been in here too long. And if it's been here in here too long, I output the check mark signal which I'm using as my reset signal. I couldn't use R for reasons, but I use the check mark signal to reset the memory cell and in the same instance that it detects that 
And this is the path assuming that it couldn't find anything valid. It all goes through here. This is what keeps the memory cell charged for this amount of time. And ordinarily, most of the time, it finds what it's looking for and it doesn't need to roll out this total timer. But if it does, it detects that and outputs D. And the D value is going to be coming from here. And it f goes in here, it outputs the D signal, but this also takes the D signal, it isolates the D signal, if uh, it failed, it isolates the D signal, then turns the D signal into a red signal, and if you will recall from the D pose, that red signal is encoded to the same value as the D pose signal from the depo uh, combinator computer thing, and that is how it knows that it failed to find a valid hauler. And again, this is connected to the green wire, that goes out. So this is the first thing that goes on the green wire, the failure. The failure is all this. But going further in, we get into this stuff, which goes in here. This is a request for something, not a request to pick up something. So it is primarily concerned with this. And so this thing is what handles the a uh, pick a uh, uh, drop off requests of stuff and it handles that because it determines if anything is greater that is equal to 2 output this dot signal this dot signal is used to know that this was successful so the memory cell is feeding into this and if the dot signal appears it outputs everything and that means it outputs the x y and the depot value so you can see the input signals and you can actually see that it seems to have, just on the same frame, it is going to succeed next turn, because you can see the output of this. It has actually, on this frame, found a valid hauler containing, uh, containing coal. Just coincidentally, it happened to find it on this frame. And you can see that the output from all these connected green wires is coal, and it is coming in here, most notably here, which is being fed by this thing that isolates each equals one. So each equals one, that would be the coal here, gets isolated, output signal is one coal, feeds in here, and you don't see it uh, working because the previous frame, the coal would have equaled two. But this frame, it equals one because it the next one it rolled over is also containing coal. Okay, so that sent out the signal, and next frame, boom, it is sending the output signals. And that means that it has found the hauler appropriate. The appropriate hauler is hauler number four. But this, in outputting everything, it also outputs the checkmark signal. And that checkmark signal resets this and this. This resets from here. That's why there's just this abomination of wires here. And you can see that it is inputting uh, all of this crap. And it will disengage next cycle. But for this cycle and the cycle after that, it is still hot. And so, to eliminate the risk of uh, any extra thing getting through, so that would cause it to, if it were to get through like that, that it succeeded twice in a row, it would uh, stop it by using another one of these uh, single frame pass-through things. I'm sure I can think of some word for that. But it's the same thing. If red signal equals zero, they're wired up in the same. If it equals zero, let it, let it through, but this will also equal zero on anything, so this will not allow anything through on the next frame, and that gives it enough time to disengage this. And this is the at pickup, so this is looking for an empty hauler. And this is a little bit different, because we, we don't care about reading the cargo's inventory. We don't care about that at all. We just know that if it has the P signal, which I made for pickup, uh, it has the P signal and the E signal, which reads from here in the big thing of this, is that if nothing appeared on this green wire, if there was nothing here, it outputs E. That goes in here, and if the, if the hauler is empty and the signal contains P, which means that the data in here is of the pickup variety, it goes into here, which is a AND gate, more or less, and that means that this also reads from the memory cell, and this is if that and that outputs into here and outputs along with that cargo hauler's ID that does that and it continues into here, which isolates all of the data. 
So it isolates the N signal, which is the hauler number. It isolates the X value, which comes from here, the XY, that is the XY of the depot, and it isolates the Y value, and the depot ID. The depot ID does not actually feed into here, which the X, Y, and N do, but we need it to go down here, which is how we handle successful dispatches. This goes on here, outputs everything on the green wire, and it tells it the hauler number and the depot number of the dispatch. So it, that's how we read the hauler number, and that's how the uh, that, that's how the hauler ID knows that its request has been successful because it goes through here. Anyway, continuing. Uh, all right, I guess I should. Uh, since we have something captured here, it will go here. You will see output signals, input signals 1, next frame, just in case, that, and in here, everything went through and is outputting everything, and you can see the input in here is there, and input, next frame, uh, make sure that next frame isn't important. Alright, next frame is, uh, next frame is important because I need to show that the N value is encoding it, so all of this feeds into the row, these are all fed into the same thing, and you can see these all have the values of n and c. So n equals 4, that means we have detected that hauler number 4 is empty, and we want to dispatch it. So we can see that all of these are that. This one doesn't have a c value because uh, it doesn't exist, so it won't be allowed in any way to check. But this one is n equals c, and that's 2, so it will not equal that and will not output everything. But hauler for this one has n equals 4 and c equals 4 so that means that it has found its corresponding corresponding hauler that was determined here so we know that this hauler is empty and we know to give it the correct input so this will this xy will only be able to go to hauler 4 that is how this works so next frame boom hauler 4 is the only one that was allowed to output that data. All the other ones have garbage. Holler 4 is very special, it has that. And we can also show here that the output signals into this are now live on the green wire and that will go to depot 51 and next frame or should activate this. But I don't want to tick forward more because I'm still going through here. So. Holler 4 now has data incoming from here that feeds all the way over here, which uh, will output everything as long as the blue signal is non-existent. And that means that next frame, boom, it outputs everything. And that goes into here and has a quick thing that it doesn't need to be this, but it's just as long as... Because this feeds in a uh, AI hauler ID, I can't do if anything equals zero, so I just did if x equals zero. So that means that it received an xy coordinate. It could be y, it doesn't really matter. But if it received that data, um, output that, and the, it outputs the blue signal, and the blue signal will feed into here. But I don't want to go too fast, because this is also inputting that, and as long as it has a valid x coordinate, or a coordinate in general, it will output next frame. So this thing is where we keep the ID of that, and we use that for communicating. So this goes in here, and next frame will output everything, and it will not output next frame because it has no XY. So that single pulse of XY data is now in there. You can see that this is outputting the blue signal, and this is uh, why I made this thing, this kind of delay to try and brown out that uh, hauler ID that it detected from here, so it tries to take this and block it there. Uh, don't worry about it. <laughs> this, that's why I did that, to try and stop it from double, because as you can see, it's taking a while to, uh, it's taking a while to actually block off. The output is actually already going out, but it hasn't locked it out yet. The blue signal is here, but now it goes into the memory cell, and the next frame, the memory cell, will be charged. And then, that is what will block anything. So that is what will block this, 
And this thing is a sort of different layer of that. It, it's sort of multi-layered. I wanted to kind of be redundant. This thing just determines what the uh, thing is. I don't have any, but this would be red if I had this built, but I didn't have a that hauler in existence. So if hauler 4 didn't exist, this would be red. But I have used all of these spaces. The, these are all associated to valid haulers, so they will only be green or blue. Green, you know, free, B equals busy. Uh... So, this uh, just detects that. This just detects if uh, the blue signal is absent and outputs green. So if there's no blue signal, it's just green. But the blue signal also goes in here. If the blue signal is zero, output everything, which is uh, C. So, and the C is red from here, so that is turned into C. Again, very complicated. That goes in here. And as long as there is no red signal, because here as well, because also the red signal I need that if the hauler doesn't exist, I don't want anything but possibly going to it. Again, it's a redundancy thing, but that amounts to C will not be output to here, and that means that it cannot receive input. That is a very long, complicated thing to get from the memory cell to the fact that it blocks out this C value, which used to be the hauler ID as read from here blocked out, gets allowed through here, then gets, uh, you know, it as long as red is zero, outputs that. Yeah, it's complicated. Okay, so we return to here, or, uh, here, where the output signal is that, and this immediately, you can see, is connected to every single one. These are all on the same wire, and that wire goes uh, over to here, over here, following, you can see that it has a signal on it, and that feeds into the dispatcher. This is what actually sends the commands, and it has a, has a value that is about to be sent into it. Next frame, the value will disappear, and hauler 51, or hauler 4, I mean, wherever it may be, will receive its instructions. And hauler 4, uh, next frame, this has also just charged because it detected that I, I just sent through an instruction and it has charged this other memory cell. So now this memory cell is charged too. And this is the second phase of the dispatch. So the, the XY coordinates have gone out. The hauler is now en route, but we don't want it to be able to receive any more information until we know that it got there. This is four, yeah, so we see that it has entered into this, so this has realized that a a dispatch has gone through and it will charge this memory cell next cycle. This is outputting that, and next cycle it should stop outputting. Yes, now it is blocked off. This is no longer outputting C, and so this whole lane is busy. This still contains the memory cell, and this goes in here just to give a little indicator, but uh, this feeds into here, which if uh, the memory, if we are in phase two, state two of that dispatch instructions have been sent, it's heading to the depot, we allow through this value of C, which is also, you know, this. I tried to use C to code it to cargo hauler, or just cargo, but basically only if uh, we are in phase two will it output C, and what that is important for is that we use this to read uh, from the main scanner. The main scanner feeds into here. Very important from the scanner feeds into here. And what that is is that hauler 4 has its value of C which is this. We can't use this because if we tried to do this equals this it would just add up to 6. Again, I hope you have a basic understanding of combinators but we can't compare two signals of the same type because they will get added together. It, it wouldn't do 3 equals 3, it would do 6. So we need to turn that into a different value, and that means of that if the ID of this lane, if the ID of this lane, which is 4, you can see 4 is in the input signals to the right over there, uh, if that is equal to the ID, which is being output by the scanner, it will output the everything about that one. And so even though these are all connected, you can see the red wire is all connecting these, all of them are connected, 
it, they are reading the same thing. It's, this will only capture the data relevant to this lane, this particular cargo hauler, who, you know, this whole too tall thing is dedicated to. So when C equals 4 is when it will output everything about that. So let's skip ahead to that. Again, this is going through using the editor to go ahead one tick at a time. So the input signals have rolled over. We are now down to ID 1, ID 2, ID 3, again, C equals that, and ID 4. This is a valid instruction, so next cycle, boom, it is outputting all of that data, and the importance of that is that it is outputting that data, which inputs into here, and it will read this signal that is unique to haulers. That signal is, uh, you can see here, the time since last command, and this is reading for ID 5 because it's one frame behind, but we go back to this and we see that it is reading a value of 57. That means it has only been 57 frames since a instruction was sent, and I have it at a minimum of, I don't know, uh, how much is 2,400 divided by 60? Uh, 40 seconds, yeah, so this is a little extreme. I had to make this because it was they were taking long amounts of time to actually complete the pathfinding, but basically all that amounts to is that it takes at least 40 seconds before it is allowed to even think about exiting phase two. So it has 40 seconds to find its pathfinding and start moving before we even start checking if it has been still, but if that time since last command signal is greater than that, it will uh, start outputting the time since moved signal. And the time since moved signal is another thing here, which is, you know, uh, used to tell if the, you know, thing has moved. And that's what I use to detect if my hauler has actually gotten there. I detect if it is standing still for five seconds. Okay, so that goes through and does that, and that is what detects it. So if this reads <clears throat> uh, the thing, so this this will continually read over every cycle, so 68 it will read over and update, and it will push through, and it will find out if it's over this, and if it's over this, it will output the time since last moved portion of that, and this will read if that is over the amount, which means it's been standing still for about five seconds, and it will output the reset signal. And that reset signal is important because it travels along this green wire into pretty much everything. This is just a massive jumble. This is very uh, specific because I couldn't mix wires willy-nilly. I had to be very... it might seem chaotic, but I had to make sure the wires were very clear that I could propagate this reset signal throughout the whole system. You can see everything is connected to this thing that has that reset signal. Everything. Also, this is a manual reset. Uh, I, I haven't actually ever used it, so this part, it seems to be functioning perfectly. There is that error I talked about, couldn't figure out where it was from, but this part is uh, perfectly fine. Anyway, that reset signal is what will disengage these memory cells. And these memory cells will say it's available and free again. But on its way out, it detects if the reset signal exists, and... These are the special things. Oh yeah, also, the, th this thing does nothing but just uh, output to this red light. It, it's, uh, I, I could get rid of it and just rely on this, but I, I wanted a second phase to know. This is mostly when I was uh, first building that. I wanted to know, because this was just if it went through first state, and I needed to know if it, was, if it was in the second state of waiting to see if it actually got there. Uh, this just determines the color. It's not important. Anyway, this, every single one of them, uh, has input, they all share this red wire, which comes from here. And that comes from this parking thing, which uses a uh, sorcery to create a pseudo-random uh, value, and that is how I can t handle the parking. So this parking thing, ha th you just need to know that this creates a weird pseudo-random nonsense. I don't need it to be actually random, I don't care, you can see it outputting just random gobbledygook. But what that does is that Modulode. I hope you know what modulode mean. If you do, if you don't, uh, look it up. But that is x value of this modulode by some variance. So what this does is it creates a variance of up to 34. So it can be plus one to 34. 
or negative, well, negative 34 to 30, positive 34, technically, but uh, it just means that it adds in this range a pseudo-random variance. That means that it, it could park here, it could park here, it could put a park here, and the Y is, uh, this delays it by one frame, so this is getting the, the previous, or the previous frame of pseudo-random for the Y, so that means that the X and Y have their own independent variances. They're different, and you can see that they kind of cluster together, but it's random enough that they're not all trying to park in the same spot. And that is, you know, 34 is X, 34 that. That is basically the width and height of this parking lot, the 34 by 34 variance. The, this whole thing is like, I don't know, 60-something. Yeah, it's about like 70 wide, so that variance of, uh, that, that variance of 68 is what allows them to park all, just all over the place and without get bunching together. And so that variance is added in, you know, combinators, any signal that gets output of the same thing is just added, so a this thing is adding 26, so the output of this is different. So you can see on the green wire, which is where it handles the parking data, you can see that the X and Y are different than what's in the constant combinator, and the constant combinator is just the this. This position beacon is how you read just like general places, but I copied that into this constant combinator, and again, this is just adding variance to make them park all over the place without bunching up. That isolates in here, so I can get it on the red wire, because I couldn't put it on the green wire. The green wire is used for the reset signal, so I could get it on the red wire. That feeds into all of these, and that means when the reset signal comes, it outputs that parking data, and the parking data, uh, I'll skip forward, as you can see, varies every single cycle by a pseudo-random amount. That means that when it comes through, it goes on this red wire, and you might recognize this red wire from here, from the initial dispatch, it goes here and to the dispatch. So it will park, it will give it the coordinates to parking, and it frees it up. I don't care if it actually makes it to parking, because if it's on its way to parking, you know, it's, it's free. It's succeeded in its mission, and it can be called again, and that's why it resets. And, uh, that is basically everything, uh, <laughs> looking over at my OBS, I see that this has taken me an hour and 24 minutes to explain, I hope maybe I can remove, uh, five minutes from that, uh, I mean, you asked for it, I remember I said, <laughs> what did I say in the video, I said, uh, I said it would take me 20 minutes to describe this, uh, yeah, try 80 minutes. Oh, okay, uh, somehow if you made it this far, congratulations, I still don't know if this actually adequately explained it, I've been drinking water to use my voice for an hour and 30 minutes straight, but I will, I'm not going to give the, uh, save file for this, because I'm, I'm keeping that as, as an exclusive to my patrons, but I will give you the blueprint to this horrendous, uh, logi brain that I have constructed. I will give you that blueprint, so if you are interested in how it actually works, or maybe want to, I guess, use it in your system, oh yeah, I guess I should also include the depots <laughs> along with that, I will include this as a blueprint so you can build it yourself if you're really so inclined. Uh, I probably wouldn't recommend it because I ran into plenty of problems on my own, but if you really, really want to, I will be giving you the blueprints. Okay. Thanks for uh, watching. If you somehow made it this far, bye.